Hello and welcome to CBS Sports HQ. Happy NFL schedule release day alongside Joe Musso. I am Hakeem Dermish. It is one of the greatest days of the year before the games are even played. We as fans project the entire season for our favorite teams. Yeah, I mean, I see 11 wins. 11. How, how could you for not? The Chicago you see, Bears. You see 11. <laughs> All right. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> How could you not be optimistic? How could you not be excited? It's always welcome. We're going to take you through it all over the next hour, but we begin with what we do know. Our starting point has been established and the countdown is on Thursday, September 7, game one of 272. The defending champion Chiefs will welcome the Detroit Lions, and that's a side that's no longer sneaking up on anybody. It's center stage and an opportunity to announce an immediate arrival. Elsewhere, Aaron Rodgers is wearing another shade of green this season, joining Gang Green after 18 seasons in Green Bay. The Rodgers era begins with the first Monday night game of the season when the Jets host Josh Allen and the Bills. Four-time MVP has won nine straight starts on Monday night football. How about God save the king of the AFC South? It will be no coronation, but Trevor Lawrence and the division favorites taking up residency in London weeks four and five. You want to crown him? Crown him then. Hey, speaking of crowning, many thought we'd get a Super Bowl rematch in week one. Instead, we'll have to wait until week 11 when Patrick Mahomes and the reigning champs welcome in Jalen Hurts and the Eagles in Super Bowl 57. Philadelphia had a 10 point lead at halftime, but the Chiefs rallied in the second half. A defensive holding call on James Bradbury in the final two minutes set up the game winning field goal for Kansas City. Full schedules are coming over the hour, but we have more than enough to sink our teeth into already. New season, same Prisco, 30 plus years in the game. Pete Prisco always in the mix alongside the two time Super Bowl champ, host of the All Things Covered podcast, Bryant McFadden. Mac, I want to go your way first here because this is really an evolving thing. Schedule release day growing into what it is now. What was your experience as a player on this day back then? Were you calling somebody? Were you glued to the TV? How locked in were you to the schedule release? Uh, not as locked in as I am right now. Like you said, Joe, <laughs> it's a primetime event. The buildup leading to the schedule release shows shows tonight where they've been highly anticipated. And I think Pete would agree to me as well. If you go back 10 plus years or so, it was big, but it's not as big as it is now. But for players, especially right now, when you look at the world of in the NFL players, how social media has been so impactful, just the attention these guys are getting, they're dialed in. Number one, as a player, you want to know exactly when do you start your divisional matchups? Because we know how important divisional ball games is in regards to playoff implications. Number Number two, primetime games. How many primetime games will we have? Luckily enough for me, playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers, we always had primetime <laughs> games. So it wasn't a really a big deal knowing we had four or five primetime games because the standard is the standard. But for other organizations that are now starting to be more consistent and more relevant, they might be in the primetime window more so than years past. And of course, how do you finish the season? That's the final thing most players look forward to in regards to are you finishing with divisional opponents? Do you have to travel to uh, uh, cold, frigid uh, uh, temperatures? Do you have to go down south? So that's those were the three things that most players look forward to when I played. And that's those were the three top things that I look forward to when I when I played as well. Just understanding divisional matchups, primetime and how did we finish the season? Yeah, and our first primetime game takes us to Arrowhead in the season over the defending Super Bowl champion Chiefs hosting the Lions. The fighting Dan Campbell's won eight of their final 10 games last season to finish nine and eight. Pete, do you like this matchup to kick off the season or would you rather prefer it be Chiefs Eagles to start the season? I would rather it be Chiefs Eagles, but uh, I see what the NFL is doing here. The Lions are definitely one of those trendy teams heading into next season. I mean, they, everybody's on them. They think they're going to win the division. But what they got to remember is, and I, and I want to put caution out there a little bit, this team has to learn how to win now with expectations. That doesn't happen in Detroit all that much. And there's a lot of young players that haven't learned how to win big games. And, and by that, I mean going on the road to face the champs in week one is a big game. It's a proving ground game. So, uh, yeah, the Lions are better. They have a lot of young talent. Uh, they have an offensive system that works. Jared Goff 
has played very well in the last uh, year. And so I get it. I understand it. And by the way, the last time Jared Goff and Patrick Mahomes faced each other when they were the Rams versus the Chiefs, it was one of the best games that we've seen on Monday Night Football. So uh, I do like this idea, but I think we got to slow the roll just a bit on the Detroit Lions. I'm right there with you. I love seeing the Detroit Lions get the spotlight because I do believe they will be a very, very competitive team, especially if you look at how they finished a year ago. But for the first ball game, come on, NFL. There's so many, of course, the Eagles. Everyone would vote to see the Eagles face off against the Kansas City Chiefs. But what about the Miami Dolphins? Right? What about the revenge game for Tyreek Hill and Tua Tunga Vailoa when you talk about the, the explosive nature that they have offensively and then just the star power in those ball games? So me personally, I, I'm okay in seeing Detroit, but I would much rather see the Eagles. And if I couldn't see the Eagles, give me Tyreek Hill, the cheater, ready to throw up the deuce on a primetime stage, the only game in town Thursday night. And you better believe it will be a lot of points scored from either direction if that was the case, but it's not. So let's see exactly what the Detroit Lions and Jerry Goff have in store. I, I know what people are thinking, right, Th that maybe have, have been slow to the Detroit Lions party. And it's hard to be slow to that because of hard knocks and, and all of the fame they got from that and the storylines. Mm -hmm. But you're thinking here, Shoot, I got to see the Lions on Thanksgiving and to start the season? Come on. <laughs> uh, we may have jumped the shark one in six to start last season. That's why they snuck in on the tail end of that great football they played at the end of the year. We'll see what they look like, but you get slapped in front of the football world that could change the course of the entire season. Uh, let's move on to our next one here that's going to be circled in green all season long. Jet fans have gotten quite acquainted with waiting this offseason. They will once again. Aaron Rodgers, his Jets debut coming in the final game of week one Monday night against a team they might have to go through come January in the Buffalo Bills. Pete, you're our foremost expert on all things Orchard Park here. This one sort of has overreaction Tuesday written all over it. What do you want to learn between these two week one? Well, I think obviously you want to see if Aaron Rodgers has had rapport with his receivers. Remember, that was a problem last year because mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers wasn't around Green Bay. He didn't have a rapport with the young receivers, with Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs, and it showed up, particularly early in the season. It looks like he's committed. It looks like he's around. So maybe this year it's different. Maybe the Jets can get off to a good start on the offensive side of the ball, provided their tackles play well. Remember, they have open competition at left tackle. They have open competition at right tackle. That's not a good thing. Uh, for Aaron Rodgers and the other thing is the Bills are the team that beat still in that division to be the champ you got to beat the champ and I want to see if the Jets are capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Bills team that I think is changing a little bit they're not going to uh, you know throw the ball around and be as loose with Josh Allen running as much as he has in the past they want to change the way they play they're going to be different on defense much more aggressive with Sean McDermott uh, taking over as the play caller with Leslie Frazier walking away so different Bills team I still think they're the team to beat but I want to see how Rodgers handles a quick start with his wide receivers because that was a problem in Green Bay last year. Well, Pete, you hit on Aaron Rodgers and his offensive teammates. The same can be said for Josh Allen. But I'd like to transition to the defensive side, right? Yes, Sean McDermott is back in the play calling saddle, calling the plays defensively for the Bills. Of course, having a healthy Von Miller. Will this defense get, get back to being a very, very consistent group, being able to put opposing offenses in uncomfortable positions to be able to create turnovers? Or will they be a, a soft group, similar to what we saw towards the end of the season, especially in the postseason, and then transition to the New York Jets? Remember, they carried their ball club the entire season, the defense that is. Will they continue to have the same level of play? Playing against Josh Allen, they know each other extremely well. Josh Allen, of course, the Jets defense, they're familiar with each other. But will they be able to be the same group that we saw a year ago now with star power at the quarterback position? So I love this matchup as well. Two teams that don't like each other, two teams that know each other extremely well, and two teams that believe they can easily win the division. I just want to put this out here. This, this stat is too good to not mention right now that our, our stats crew put out. Uh, Aaron Rodgers in terms of his touchdown to interception ratio. The Jets have the worst passing touchdown to interception ratio in the NFL since 2008. Uh, Rodgers wow. has the highest touchdown interception ratio in NFL history. Rodgers could throw an interception on 351 straight attempts and still have a better ratio than the Jets <laughs> since 2008. Let that sink in. That's how putrid the quarterbacking has been. In, in, for the Jets and now you bring Aaron Rodgers yeah he's 39 years old he's a four-time MVP yeah he's only won one Super Bowl 
But I mean, this if you're a Jets fan, I mean, yeah, I get it. You got we got to get the playoffs first, but you're feeling pretty good. It's the ratio last year for Aaron Rodgers that worried me a little bit, but it's going to be fun to find out. We get to play these games, these uh, mental yeah. acrobatics here. It's the beauty of the day. Yep. All right, let's move along. <laughs> AFC South champion Jags are playing back to back games in London in weeks four and five. First team ever to do that. Trevor Lawrence and the Jags will face the Falcons and then the Bills. Pete is the unofficial mayor of Jacksonville and a certified man of the people. <laughs> How is Duval County feeling about its squad playing back to back games in London? We got to remember, one of those games is not their home game. Right. It's a Bills home game. So from that standpoint, it's worked out great from a scheduling standpoint. You don't have to go to Buffalo. Instead, you play them uh, it, over in London where basically you're the home team. So I think that's a good thing for Jacksonville. So they get Atlanta, uh, a home game over there, and then you get Buffalo. Those are both, you know, to their advantage. And when you look at their schedule to start the season, I've said it all, you know, summer, all winter long so far. Here's the thing. They will be playing against rookie quarterbacks in their own division, likely in all six games, or it could work out that way. They also play Bryce Young, rookie quarterback. They will also play Desmond Ritter, a second-year quarterback. If they don't win nine, eight, nine games of the ones in their division and the ones where they play the NFC South, I will be shocked. Think about this. At Indy, that's a rookie quarterback. This is their schedule to open. Versus Kansas City, tough game, but you're at home. Versus Houston, rookie quarterback. Versus Atlanta, second-year quarterback. Buffalo and London. Versus the Colts, who is, a, again, a rookie quarterback. That is a team that should be the number one seed in the AFC. That sounds crazy because they're not the best team in the AFC. But everybody else, the divisions are tough. This division is not. If Jacksonville doesn't win 12, 13 games, I will be astounded. Mm, I, I, I see where you're coming from because, yes, in their division alone, it's extremely watered down, not to mention no star power at the quarterback position outside of Trevor Lawrence. But in regards to this question, Jacksonville playing two back-to-back -back, you know, uh, games overseas, we have to wait and see because we've never seen this before. The luxury is, yes, you don't have to travel to Buffalo. Traveling to Buffalo in October, November, December, it doesn't matter. It's a very, very difficult place to play. So you get them in a neutral setting. You should like that. Number two, you get Atlanta. was supposed to be a home game, but you get them right there. So you have the luxury of staying over there instead of traveling, coming back. So let's see exactly how it plays out. But I can tell you this much for players. I don't know if the Jacksonville Jaguars players currently like this idea. There's nothing they can do about it, but they have to go as they go because we've never seen this before. And if it works out, let's say they win both ball games. Heck, you know Jacksonville, they probably will love to repeat it again next year. But let's say they go 0-2. We might not see this same trend the following year in 2024. So this is a wait-and-see approach in, my, in regards for me. But for most players, I'm willing to bet most of the Jacksonville Jaguars are like, man, yo, we got to stay over there like two weeks? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's a tall task to ask. But if they win, no one will be complaining. Yeah, but BMAC, think about it from this standpoint. And I don't know if you ever did this when you were with the Steelers, but if you play back-to-back -back games on the West Coast, a lot of teams leave on Friday, play on Sunday, stay over and play the following Sunday. They stay somewhere, practice out there, get their whole work out there for a week so it's not any different than that because Jacksonville will leave on a Friday to play the first game against Atlanta and then stay over and come back after the game on Sunday so it's really no different than teams that go out west and play and stay for a week and then play again on the west coast I don't know if you've ever done that and what it was like yeah. but that's that's the reality of it it's just well, I would say this Pete I would much rather if I had to play two teams on the west coast I would much rather stay over there two weeks and stay in a place that I'm a little familiar with. Mm. Let's say we had to play the Cardinals and then play the Raiders. You know what? I'm familiar with both areas, so I can navigate <laughs> and move around. Being overseas, no. And then, of course, for me, I'm a food guy. I love being in places where I know I'm going to get good, good meals. It's a you lot know, of mushy food peas. over there, overseas, it's not, really, well, it's not really the best place you can potentially get compared to what we have over here. They, Some places. BMAC, they, they do have ketchup in London. He's worried about, worried, worried about the bangers and mash for a two-week stretch. B, but yeah. B, B Mac loves ketchup, so he puts it on everything. So it doesn't matter. You can put it on everything, and you get yourself an IPA. I always wonder about the tax situation. Like you got to go over there and the taxes, yeah. uh, right? You got to you got to deal with the taxes yeah. at the end of the season with your with your uh, your your tax specials. You got to go. Hey, I play a couple it, games. It isn't any worse than California. It isn't any worse than California. Good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. See, that's what we pay you for. On point analysis right there with Pete Prisco and B Mac. Much more ahead as we continue here on CBS.